for the ITC uh, lunch. Um, we just had an uh, excellent uh, uh, ITC colloquium by Mario Giulio, used to be in our corridor. Mario is over there, it's easy to see him, he's very tall. And uh, doing uh, fascinating preparatory work uh, for LSST. So we very much look forward to hearing more from him uh, in a few minutes. Uh, I also wanted to introduce uh, Carlos Aguerres. They say, it in, yeah. okay. Uh, originally from uh, Peru, who is uh, who was selected uh, uh, as one of the uh, junior uh, faculty uh, candidates. Uh, an offer was made by the uh, science division of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard. And Carlos works on uh, works on. Um, Ice cube and uh, detecting cosmic rays. If any of you might be interested in speaking with him, we are trying to convince him to come to Harvard. So it should be a good impression. Uh, in the physics department. So he, even though he will be in physics, uh, he will hopefully interact with people here interested in cosmic rays. Uh, so, and neutrinos. Yes, and as you may have heard, our, uh, there is. Uh, there are some events detected by ANITA, which are uh, now uh, very pathological and un not understood. Uh, that um, at first people thought maybe related to neutrinos, uh, which tend to be 18 electron volts, but uh, if they were, we would have seen something with ice cube that is not being seen. Uh, so they cannot come from uh, conventional astrophysical sources with uh, standard model physics. And uh, people argue that there must be some new physics making those events. So keep an eye on those events. Uh, we need more information, but perhaps they indicate new physics. Uh, so uh, we start uh, with a talk by uh, Oriana. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. I should know how to say that because my ma mother was from Bulgaria. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, um, she will speak about limitations to the basic pod model and beyond, and explain what pod means. <laughs> um, then uh, we we'll hear from Jack Steiner, who is the CFA colloquium speaker today. He also gets the Bob Prize. Uh, where is Jack? Over there. And many of you know him. Uh, he, he spent a lot of time here at the CFA uh, before. And he will talk about the past spectral timing analysis of black hole X-ray binaries with NICER. Then we'll hear from Mario again about the uh, astronomy data commons, archives in the clouds. And finally, we'll hear from uh, Paul Schechter uh, from MIT, not far away, who lives actually not, not very far from us, uh, uh, on Lillian Street, yes. Uh, and he will talk about uh, the images of strongly lensed, uh, of a strongly lensed quasar uh, that lie very close to the two or four intersections of Witt's hyperbola and Wynn's ellipse. That sounds very technical, but Paul will explain everything. Oh, uh, hyperbola and ellipses. <laughs> <laughs> only, only our planetary scientists will understand about those. <laughs> but, you know, things coming from across, you know, other solar systems, they're at hyperbolic orbits, aren't they, Tommy? Yes, they are. Then you know about this. <laughs> I was just trying to be generous to uh, our MIT colleagues. Oriana, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, hi, I would like to tell you about a project that I hope will become central to my PhD thesis under my amazing advisors, Saunak, Daniel, and Lars. Um, with the wealth of data that we will acquire in the next decade or so, it will become increasingly more important to understand uh, the biases and um, systematic errors that come with the models that we uh, employ to infer cosmological parameters with. Um, and one of these uh, models is called the HOD, and I will explain that in uh, the next few slides. Um, but uh, essentially, uh, we are here examining the kind of mistakes that come from using that and some ideas of how that can be um, improved. 
Um, so one of the questions that um, numerical cosmologists have been wondering um, about for uh, decades now is given an n-body simulations, which, which simulation, which is to say a dark matter only simulation, how do we paint galaxies on top of it? Um, and so if we zoom into a, um, one of the regions in this like intricate web, we would see that it's actually made up of these uh, tiny clumps of dark matter, and they're <laughs> called um, halos. This is my um, artistic impression of what a halo looks like. Um, and each of these halos is made up of tiny subhalos, some of which contain galaxies and some of them, uh, some of which remain dark. And so the question here is uh, how do we determine where to give galaxies? Um, one nice thing about hydrodynamical simulations is that they already, they already have all of these physics models incorporated into them, so we do end up with a natural kind of galaxy population that is actually quite believable uh, with the new simulations. Um, however, it comes at the expense of computational resources, and also, therefore, it tends to be smaller in volume. So in order to make robust predictions for upcoming surveys, we do need to employ these kind of uh, larger and body simulations, and we do need to adopt galaxy <coughs> population models. Um, and what is the most widely used, uh, probably, um, model for um, painting galaxies is the HOD, or Halo Occupation Distribution Model. And it relies on the assumption that the only thing that determines how many galaxies a given halo hosts um, is uh, its mass. So basically, if one knows the mass, one can determine the uh, galaxies. And uh, the curve that, um, uh, that you see here can either be derived empirically from a hydrodynamical simulations, or one can also employ some kind of like analytical ex expressions such as the one developed by Zhang et al. Uh, in particular, the curve that we're showing here comes from the illustrious TNG simulation, which has about 12,000 galaxies in a volume of 205 megaparsecs over H in the way that we define galaxies. Um, and uh, the nice thing about the illustrious TNG simulation is that we believe that it has reached a um, sufficient <coughs> level of sophistication so that its galaxy formation and evolution um, looks um, plausible. Um, and also because we have, a, we have access to both a hydrodynamical or, or full physics run and also in an n-body or dark matter only run. And if one has a lot of free time, um, one can basically like trace the history of um, each of these like halos with and without physics. Um, so our particular focus is studying the galaxy populations that, would, that we see in the hydrodynamical run and comparing them to something that's an HOD-like uh, galaxy sample. So here's the prescription in more detail. The first thing we do is we match bijectively the halos from the full physics run to those in the dark matter run. And once we have that for all halos of interest, uh, we can either ascribe or like assign the galaxies from the full physics run directly on top of the dark matter run, or instead what we can do is we can define uh, mass bins of um, kind of like almost constant mass and shuffle the occupation numbers within these mass bins. Essentially, yeah, this is an illustration of what it looks like, uh, but essentially this preserves the kind of like HOD shape and what we eventually get is a galaxy sample which is HOD-like, effectively an HOD. So we end up with a full physics um, real galaxy sample and a HOD-like sample um, for the dark matter run. And the one thing we can study now is how do these statistics compare? How do their statistics <laughs> compare? And uh, let's do that through um, galaxy clustering or correlation functions. Uh, here's what the correlation function looks like for the full physics run. And here's what it looks like for the dark matter only run. And what we need to pay attention to here is that on cosmological scales of one megaparsecs over H or more, we see a discrepancy of about 15%. And to put that into perspective, that's actually quite significant given, given that in the next decade or so, we are aiming to pin down uh, the cosmological parameters down to a sub-percentage level. So if our <coughs> models are essentially flawed at a 15% level, that means that whatever we infer from them will also be biased. Um, so one example is the halo uh, mass inferred. Um, so the question now is what can we do? Can we alleviate this tension in some way? And uh, we can 
augment the HOD model by including another parameter uh, apart from mass. Uh, we do that for a couple of parameters that people have um, generally been interested in, uh, such as environment, velocity and isotropy, and so on. And in fact, what we see is that if we now, instead of kind of like shuffling randomly these um, occupation numbers in mass bins, if we now rank order things so that like the most dense um, halo gets the most galaxies and so on and so on, we see that in fact we see an increase in the galaxy clustering uh, by a very significant percentage in the case of um, environment and velocity and isotropy. And for um, other parameters that are actually the usual suspects, we don't see that big of a difference. And here the question might be, um, either in the way that we um, define these, or maybe there is indeed something special about uh, environment and velocity and isotropy, which makes them have such an impact. Um, so we decided to, oh, uh, I, just, I just wanted to mention that these parameters are usually what people refer to as galaxy assembly bias. Uh, so, yeah. Um, and so we decided to dive into um, some of these parameters. So for example, for uh, the environment, which turns out to be the most important one, uh, we uh, employed a uh, definition, a new definition of um, environment, which actually uses a standard kind of like tidal web definition. Uh, it transforms the dark matter density field into a kind of cosmic web field uh, through some Fourier transforms. And that leaves us with four types of um, environments, peaks, filaments, sheets, and voids. And essentially, if we now take the halos and we assign them to um, one such galaxy depending on where they live, we can repeat the same exercise from before with the random shuffling, but only within these um, environments. And what we see now is that on large scales, this result is much more consistent with one. And here I'm showing the ratio between the hydrodynamical to the uh, HOD model. So it's much more consistent with one and the 15% discrepancy seems to have gone away. Um, so the conclusion that we might be drawing from here is that at a fixed halo mass, maybe galaxies behave differently depending on what environment they live in. Um, and of course, this is something that we will con continue to um, consider, but um, I mean, this is where we stop with the paper for now. Uh, but um, for the future, it's important to um, kind of like concentrate on ways to uh, reduce these errors and uh, constrain cosmological parameters from galaxy surveys. And that would inevitably move us one step closer to better understanding um, the kind of like underlying fundamental things about our universe. Um, and yeah, I'm leaving you with my conclusions and uh, thank you so much for the attention. It might be many things. I think that one of the things that we are currently kind of like looking into is whether it correlates with uh, the merger history. So maybe galaxies and filaments tend to have undergone more mergers or things like that. And um, so that is one possibility. Um, another one might just be related to uh, surely the density of uh, these environments. Yeah. 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 Um, so maybe along those lines. So, um, how did you settle on uh, using this uh, halo environment as the other kind of metric? And are there some other choices that you considered are like did it, did it help some or not? Right? Yeah, yeah, I guess um, with this slide, I was trying to say that we tried to examine a lot of different uh, secondary parameters, um, and we just found that uh, the environment tends to have uh, the qu kind of like largest um, impact on uh, the galaxy clustering. Um, yeah, but I think that there are other works that also found that yeah, to be the case. Yeah, I was thinking more observationally. And oh. Some people try, like, Oh yeah, um, I think that that's like definitely a direction in which we can go. For now, we have kind of like concentrated on more of like the theoretical things that we can infer directly from the uh, simulation and not really approaching it from a kind of like observational point of view, but that's a good point, yeah.
mass is gone, in your map of observers to mass, still you get a scatter of the actual of the relation between the two. Yeah, so I guess we have to like take into account that scatter, but if the fundamental <laughs> assumption that we make with um, these kinds of like um, mock galaxy catalogs is flawed at the 15% level, that means that it's going to contribute even more to this uncertainty. Um, because this is indeed what people use when, uh, when they make these kind of like robust predictions um, um, for future galaxy surveys. Oh, sorry. No. All right, so uh, for, for my day job, I uh, returned to CFA in April working on Chandra, but I also moonlight studying uh, X-ray binary systems largely with NICER lately. And I would like to convince you that while NICER, uh, a new X-ray telescope I'm going to be telling you about, its day job is measuring the equation of state of neutron stars. And we had a big release about this a couple of months ago. But I want to convince you that it's really uh, moonlighting as the premier X-ray timing instrument on the sky for studying black hole X-ray binaries. So if any of you haven't uh, heard about NICER, this is a, a picture of NICER at its home on the space station. NICER is that uh, big block sitting on an arm right in front of the solar panels there. So this gives you a sense of what's wonderful and what's challenging about uh, living on the space station. We get uh, connected power telemetry, but we also have these large, beautiful structures that some, sometimes swing in front of what we want to point to. Um, so what you can't quite make out there is that that array of uh, black objects on the back of NICER are actually 56 uh, concentrator optics that single bounce focus x-rays onto silicon drift detectors, which e each of which essentially acts like a single pixel clocking out very fast. <clears throat> and um, we take advantage of this very fast X-ray timing capability. Uh, I should say there's no imaging capability, uh, but to to do some really exciting things uh, for studying um, X-ray objects in the sky. So just to millisecond. sorry, millisecond. Nanoseconds. Yes. <laughs> this is yeah. It's uh, it's it's uh, clocks out at I think about 14 nanoseconds. Yeah, very fast. Um, so this is showing you the specs for, for NICER in comparison to some other uh, similar instruments. So this is, in fact, showing NICER's effective area compared to that of XMM. And you see that NICER has about twice the effective area of XMM. In fact, it's the largest soft X-ray uh, collecting area on the sky right now. Um, but it is fundamentally a timing instrument. So while it's natural in some ways to compare it to XMM or Chandra or Swift, which have similar energy range, um, it's actually more akin to uh, doing the science of RXTE, which was uh, the premier X-ray timing instrument on the sky for 16 years. So compared to RXTE, uh, NICER has 25 times better time resolution. Uh, it also has far better energy resolution. It, it's, a, it's a silicon detector, so you get the same kind of energy resolution you get with uh, you know, Chandra CCDs, XMM CCDs. Uh, about 100 to 200 EV. That's in comparison to RXT, which had a, an energy resolution of 1 to 2 keV. Um, it also gives us very high sensitivity to faint sources, like the uh, uh, faint neutron stars it's uh, primarily targeting to measure equation of state. But it's also capable of handling the brightest objects on the sky with no pileup. And so that's been really game changing for those of us working on uh, galactic binary systems. <coughs> Um, just to illustrate this for you, for the objects near and dear to my heart, black hole X-ray binaries, this is showing an outburst of GX339, kind of the prototypical transient, as measured with RXTE in blue, tracing out this Q or turtle head, uh, see the, the left over there if you're confused about turtle head, uh, <laughs> pattern that's, that's typical for an outburst. It rises in a hard state, 
transitions to a soft state and then uh, with some hysteresis fades and then returns to a hard state and quiescence. In blue, you're seeing the RXTE uh, count rates. And when I take all of those data and fold the, uh, the modeled, um, the, the best fits to those data through the nicer response, I get the red points. So you see in the, in the uh, hard state, we're always essentially as good as RXTE with nicer. But when we go to soft states, we're a factor of five or so better. And let me show you why that is. This is uh, an illustration of a typical uh, soft state for, or a thermal state for a black hole X-ray binary. And you see there's this very bright uh, thermal disk peaked at about 1 keV. And in yellow, I'm showing Nicer's band pass. You see that that's exactly centered on this bright, prominent disk. So if you want a machine for extracting as much information about the disk as readily as possible, you would build Nicer. And I'm very glad that they did. Um, just to highlight now for you uh, a, a very fun overview of all of what NICER is doing. This is a light curve not of an object but of an observatory showing you the count rates uh, of every object that NICER has looked at um, over the past uh, three or so years. And you're seeing that a large amount of parameter space occupied down here for very faint targets. Those are mostly the, uh, the hot spots on um, isolated neutron stars that we're using to get an equation of state. But you see this enormous dynamic range going all the way up to SCO X1, CRAB, and things that are brighter than CRAB up top. So I'm going to tell you very quickly about some of the fun things we're doing with two black hole systems there, uh, GRS 1915 and MAXI 1820, the, the uh, green and the red curves, respectively. So this is GRS 1915. It's uh, a remarkable source that's uh, in sort of a frenemy category to anyone working on black hole X-ray binaries. It's enormously unusual, it's always surprising, and um, it's been stuck for the last 25 years or so in this state that's, uh, that's typically quite transient for every other black hole binary that's gone into Alpers. So most things transition from this bright hard state to a bright soft state in a couple of days. Uh, GRS 1915 has been stuck there at its Eddington limit in this limbo for, again, decades. And it's not only in this in unstable state, but it's doing very bizarre unstable things. Uh, this is showing you a collection of four out of roughly 26 of uh, its library of, of unusual Greek classified uh, spectral timing states. So these are measured in uh, just roughly a couple of hours apiece, each of these curves. Um, and what you're seeing is hardness, hardness diagrams in the top panels and light curves in the bottom panels. These are bizarre uh, repeating phenomena where Juris 1915 goes through some chaotic looking oscillation, but then knows how to repeat that same kind of pattern again and again uh, for hours, sometimes weeks, and that's in comparison to viscous time scales that are a few seconds for the system. So there's something stable that's unstable in this bizarre source. Most of these we can't really do much with because they're so bizarre, uh, but there's one regular pattern, the heartbeat state, that um, in very heroic work a few years ago by Joey Nielsen, uh, Joey phased up all of uh, these heartbeats individually with uh, uh, a long conglomeration of RxDE data. And he was able to find that over the course of these sort of brightness pulsations, actually the temperature and the inner radius are also oscillating. So he finds that it gets, there's a breathing mode where gas moves in, things get very bright, and then gas moves out. So there's something pushing in and out this breathing mode for this heartbeat phase. So this was very interesting. But I want to show you now what we can do with NICER. This is a three second spectrum with NICER. And I think you'll all agree this is not very elegant, but this is sufficient signal to tell you something very uh, promising about what's going on. So if you want to fit a temperature and a normalization to this, I think you, you'll be convinced you can do that. And by doing that, in 5,000 count chunks, which translates to a few seconds of time, we have something like real-time measurements of what Joey was doing by phase folding lots of data. So you see GRS 1915 in different snapshots here where sometimes it's quiet, nothing happening. Sometimes it's going through heartbeat-like pulsations and we find the same behavior that Joey did, <coughs> these breathing modes. But we're also able to do these non-repeating patterns where there is no phase folding to occur. And we find here that there is uh, the same kind of breathing behavior, but 
who knows what's governing this? It's completely chaotic. So this was this is transforming our view of GRS 1915. Um, and now I want to show you what we're doing with that same kind of analysis taken to Maxi 1820, this uh, six crab right, beautiful transient that went bang in 2018 and has been really uh, a lot of fun for those of us in the in the nicer team. Um, we the same kind of operation breaking. Uh, Maxi 1820 into 5,000 count chunks. It's so bright that uh, at peak, this is uh, count rates that give us just 0.2 second spectra. So we have 2 million spectra in total for this source, uh, breaking it down in this way. And I want to point out that 0.2 seconds is lower than the viscous time scale for the inner disk. So for the first time, we're doing actual spectroscopy within the viscous time scale. And I want to show you a little bit of what that looks like in my last few minutes. Uh, this is actually a light curve in the left panel um, with these very short time scales showing what is normally kind of a faint hard state, but you see that it has an enormous amount of flaring in it. This is a uh, very large flicker noise that makes actually uh, short time scales in the hard state brighter than the brightest hard, uh, soft state. So that's rather surprising and um, you know, the first time this has really been seen cleanly like this. Um, this is transitioning, I should say, not as a turtle head diagram, but a dolphin this time. So this is the, the nicer view. So this is, um, I'll, I'll finish up quite quickly. This is rising in a hard state, transitioning to a soft state, and then back down again. And when we look at what's going on by analyzing temperature versus normalization for these data, uh, what this is telling us is that the disk starts out rather truncated um, out here in green, but, but not very truncated, a factor of a few times larger than the ISCO. It comes down to the ISCO in a soft state where it remains parked uh, for the remainder of that outburst. Uh, Aaron Kara did some very exciting work doing uh, uh, reverberation mapping, showing that um, in the transition going from hard to soft, the corona appears to shrink. There's increasing uh, frequency lags um, associated with that transition, telling us that the uh, distance between corona and, and uh, disk must be shrinking. And the last thing I want to point out to you is um, very interesting work that um, I've been doing with uh, Jakob van den Eyden in Amsterdam, where we've taken the spectral data at these very short time scales, and we're finding QPOs not just in uh, count space, but for the first time we're finding it in spectral parameters, and we're finding that uh, the spectral parameters in red there uh, are much more prominent, the QPOs, than in, in the black and blue that's the, uh, uh, the raw data. So with that, I'll put up my conclusions and take questions. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, uh, so, well, I, I guess I, I can tell you that um, we have a couple of preliminary spin measurements for this source, and all indications are that the spin is quite low. Uh, it's even favorable to a, a retrograde spin. So it, um, it's, a, it's, a very, um, it's a very soft, sort of smooth, well-behaved source for us, and whether or not that's connected to it having low spin, we're not sure, but we're still finalizing the numbers for this. But all indications are that it's, it's quite low, and... Um, one thing that I was curious to find out is when we're probing within this viscous time scale now, which is happening in this bottom right corner, will we see something unusual that doesn't look like the canonical thin disk model? And the, the boring but helpful answer is no. It looks, it's happy with a thin disk prescription. Nothing shows wild variations down here. Uh, there, there's some, I should say, this, this back corner of sort of scattered blue and purple is probably just either model or calibration uncertainty, but the, the dense trends there, everything seems very happy with a thin disk prescription. Nothing obvious from within the ISCO or something like this. Well, uh, it, so the peak for this, let me, let me say, that's also important, is probably around 10 to 15 percent Eddington is the, the peak of the outburst from the you know, best estimate for, uh, for distance and mass and so on. Um, so it never got enormously bright where we would expect sort of these thick disk um, effects to kick in, these, these slim disk transitions. So it, it looks like it has a, a clean, well-defined, sharp ISCO. Um, that's what the, the thermal data are telling us. <coughs>
<laughs> I noticed in one of the light curves, one of the last light curves you showed, uh, let's see, it, there were some dropouts they, right here. Ah, yeah. And I was wondering, is that actually something that's resolved, and is it significant that you're having these dropouts? So this is actually just uh, NICER's uh, observing cadence on the source. We had a few gaps, these annoying solar panels that they like to have for some reason. Um, yeah, so there are some, some windows where we, we don't, we have a few days where we can't get a, a good amount of time on the source itself. So this is, um, you know, it, everything is sort of dense, smushed up together, but most of these are happening in sort of, um, you know, a couple of one or two kilosecond chunks that are just close enough together that it looks continuous, but there are gaps between those because the ISS orbits every hour and a half or so. Uh, well, no. This is this is taking everything in aggregate and breaking it into sort of fraction of a second chunks. So this is each of these is an individual spectrum and spectral fit. Well, I guess that's what I was asking. Then, so because then wouldn't what appears here as a change in flux correspond to a genuine change in flux? Yes. So these dropouts. By dropout, I, I meant the. Um, oh, I'm sorry. The the dips. Some of those right. some of those might be actually when it's coming onto the source or coming off of the source. In, in fact, that's probably the case because the, uh, so Saku just asked about the, the pointing stability. It's, it's a, the, the collimator is about an arc minute collimated and I start letting this pipeline run when it's uh, two arc minutes away. So it's close, but there is a little bit of jitter that normally you would never see, but in a unusual analysis like this, I think some of those are getting through and that's why there are some of those dips. So I think that's, that's artificial in this case. QPOs. Yes. Did 1915 do anything new or different compared well, to before? And did this fellow do anything interesting? Well, I, I should say the most. So, so this fellow does have some QPO, some some uh, some low frequency QPOs that we're tracing early on uh, here at about 0 0.2 hertz. Um, so that's that's part of why we could look at this in the spectral parameters itself. But it's a rather weak QPO source. It's not very strong. And no high frequency. No high frequency. We've been waiting for high frequency QPOs. Unfortunately, nothing has uh, cooperated thus far. Um, and uh, in terms of GRS-1915, we've seen some, some of these states, depending on if you ask Tommaso Bologna or Joey Nielsen or some of the Ron Remillard, uh, some of these may be sort of mergers of different of those Greek library classes. So there's some classification ambiguity, whether or not it's doing the same things that have been seen before or something new. But what's most remarkable is that for the first time uh, in its you know, 30 years that it's been on or thereabouts, it's declining. So we think it might actually be turning off. And it's, it's exhibiting these sort of bright flares and bouncing around. But it looks like it, you know, the age of GRS 1915 might be coming to an end. But, but it continually surprises. So who knows? Maybe in another few months, it'll be back bright again. But you see the standard, whatever, 67 hertz. Uh, Yes, yes, we do see this uh, sometimes. Sometimes, but it is there, and it's always at the same frequency. Uh, I, be, I, I can't say with confidence we haven't seen it move around, but we have seen the 67 hertz at 67 hertz. I, uh, I don't believe we've seen any jitter in that, but I, I could be mistaken. Thank you. Okay, uh, now for something completely different. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Mario Urich. Um, I'm at University of Washington. I'm, I'm glad to be back here. I used to be uh, a postdoc here about uh, 10 years ago, and, and uh, I see lunch has both changed and, and hasn't changed. Uh, it, uh, so what I'm going to tell you about uh, here, I thought uh, this is not going to be a topic about a particular astronomical discovery or, or particular theory. This is going to be more about the methodology of how we might end up working with large data sets um, in the era of missions like LSST, W first, and so forth in the 2020s. And 
what I want to motivate this this by is is this chart, which uh, um, the Space Telescope um, maintains, showing the rise of uh, archive-driven astronomy, or like to call it data set-driven mm -hmm. astronomy. So what you see here is the, the number of publications, the HST publication rates, um, divided up into a couple of categories. GI programs are down here. This is purely archival, and this is part GI, part archival. The point being here is that the GI programs are you know, roughly at the same, have been roughly in the same rate uh, since uh, the late 90s, whereas archival programs and combined programs have started growing. So these data sets that we kept from, from the mission uh, are giving back uh, you know, as much as, almost as much as, as new observations are. And this is just an example. If you pick almost any archive today, you're gonna see similar plots uh, with, uh, with maybe even, even greater distinction. Um, so how do we, how's this archival science done? Um, typically, you have yourself, this is you, this is me, uh, the user who accesses the archive to grab a data set. The archive is uh, somewhere remote. Uh, you access a website. You download that data set, download it locally, and then you have an analysis resource that you have. So here it might be Odyssey, it might be a different um, um, computing system, but where the data is and where the computing is are typically not the same place. Um, so where we ended up with, uh, uh, the reason why, why, that, uh, why that is the case and, um, and the, the consequence at the same time is that we're operating today in, in what we call a, a subset download analyze paradigm where, where subset here is, is a verb. Um, we take the potentially large data set that, that sits somewhere in an archive and that over there is the SDSS archive user interface. We try to come up with a query that down selects, that filters to perhaps a couple of percent of the data that's interesting to us, partly because the data is large. We download that locally. We do some analysis, uh, build some great products uh, and try to understand what's happened. If that doesn't work out, go back to the archive, pull out another subset, download, analyze, and this goes on and on and on in a loop. Um, and this has been fantastic. This has really served us well for, for a while. But there are cracks in this, in this paradigm. And I remember when I was here, when we, when we got PanStars, uh, we started working with PanStars, the, the big issue was that we discovered that most of the science we wanted to do in PanStars was statistical in nature. We wanted to build maps. We wanted to find unusual objects. We wanted the entire data set. So kind of the tradition became the first thing you do when a new data set appears is download the whole thing. Um, now that's becoming an issue because the next big data set is going to be on order of hundreds of terabytes, potentially petabytes. And so instead, the download the whole thing approach uh, is going to remain possible, uh, especially for, for um, you know, institutions that, that, that can support it, that have the know-how, that, that, that uh, have the resources. But more generally, it'll become difficult to a typical astronomer to do that. So the solution instead is, rather than download the data set, bring the computing and the code to the data. And so for LSST uh, that, that I've worked on for, for the last couple of years, uh, this is kind of the paradigm that, that we envision. We're going to have users accessing what we're calling the LSST science platform uh, over the internet through three different kinds of interfaces through a portal, which is, you know, imagine a typical archive today, like, like URSA or like MAST, but then also through rich interfaces like Jupyter. Um, so you'll be able to spin up a Jupyter notebook and work right then and there on the analysis, uh, as if your machine was effectively in the data center, or do work or access it directly programmatically through web APIs. Um, but the idea is to bring that analysis into the data center rather than have you download the entire, uh, uh, the entire uh, potentially petabyte scale data set. Now, I think this is going to be improvement for the first couple of years with, with LSST. Um, it's, it's, it will enable anyone to go from you know, zero to doing science and LSST um, in essence in a matter of days and the time it takes you to understand the, uh, the, 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 what is the data set that's, that's in there and how to use the tools. But thinking beyond that, um, issues remain. Um, this concept, by the way, is called the science platform, or uh, the, the, this, is, this is kind of the, the name that the community has converged on, uh, the science platform being the idea of 
having a Jupyter type interface in front of your archive so that you can work uh, remotely. But current science platform concepts have some issues. And the, the, the primary one, um, kind of in, in my view, is that, say for LSST, we're going to expose this, uh, this big Jupyter interface. And then we need to provide some computing. We're going to have hundreds, potentially thousands of users. So that means now I have to have enough computing you know, in, in the fields, cornfields of Illinois, uh, where the data center is, uh, to support that many users. And that's costly. Um, that's, uh, that's unlikely to, to be done. So in the end, what you end up with is a fairly small allocation per user. So only on order of 10 cores or a few terabytes. So you have this huge data set, but you get only 10 cores to to, to, to manipulate it with. Um, the second problem is uh, data continues to be stored in relatively traditional databases. So if you actually want to operate on the entire data set, uh, you, your entire data set goes through like this tiny bottleneck, which is, which is uh, both not very performant and, um, and, not, and somewhat complex. And the biggest problem in, in my view is LSSD is not the only thing out there in the 2020s. We're going to have WFIRST, we're going to have Euclid, we're going to have all these other, uh, Gaia today, the, 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 the primary, like the raw catalog is in order of a petabyte. All these data sets that want to cross match uh, between each other. And they are all behind this kind of a science platform interface and geographically separate in their own location. So if I want to grab LSST and say WFIRST, or, um, and do some kind of interesting cross-matching in to, to understand the SCDs of objects, I'm back to square one where I was 10 years ago with PanStars. I need to download now two data sets to do the same thing. So this all builds up to this idea that uh, we're calling astronomy data commons. Um, and and it's, uh, the, the main proposal is basically to shift all the world's data set, and you know, I'm being a bit maximalistic here, um, and, and data streams, so alert streams, into the same data lake, so into the same logical place um, on the web. And the, the, today, um, if you want to really think about it, about it in concrete terms, it will be the same region on AWS or in, on the Google platform or, in AW, or on, on Microsoft's uh, Azure. Um, all the, 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 the archives still continue to, let's say LSST archive continues supporting LSST. Um, the, the Gaia, the ESA supports Euclid. Uh, oh, sorry, um, Gaia, um, Euclid on, on, on our end is would be would come from Ursa and so on, but they're all effectively in the same place computationally speaking. And the science archives that that these um, that these archives, uh, the science platforms that, they are, that these archives run, now operate on their data sets. But since the data sets are all in the same data lake uh, on 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 a cloud resource they're able to actually access any data set that's in here directly. So if I want to cross-match LSST to Euclid, um, I can do that directly from, from the LSST science platform or any, any other ones. Um, the, the other thing you could do with, the, with this kind of model is um, you allow for others to come in and provide, you basically open up the data sets. Let's say if I have a service that I want to provide that operates on top of, say, the ZTF data set that, uh, that I'm familiar with. Um, right now, ZTF data set is, it lives in Pasadena. It's in, in IPAC. If I want a service that runs on, on the data set, I need to get in touch with someone in IPAC, get, get it installed there, get it approved, and so on and so on. If you have the data set in the public cloud, you can basically install the service yourself and run it. Um, and this is equivalent to what, uh, you can think of this as, um, remember when um, 10, 15 years ago, Google came out with Google Maps. And initially it was just Google's app. At some point they opened it up, made it, made it possible to access it by APIs to build services on top of it. And then this whole economy of, of eco so this whole ecosystem of, of additional applications exploded because now you could easily build on top of what already existed. So these are the kinds of things I can imagine here. For example, I could imagine um, an, an asteroid detection system that runs on every single data set rather than just an LSS T data set. Where we're heading with this, we actually have an implementation uh, that runs on, on ZTF. Um, so we have 100 billion observations and 2.3 billion light curves in, in this, plus uh, some additional data sets that runs on AWS. It can basically 
answer any query in, uh, in a matter of minutes because it auto scales. That's the big advantage of the system. When it comes to computing, however many cycles you get there, uh, you have and, and you're able to use. Um, and we're working with, uh, with URSA and uh, with, uh, with a number of other archives to kind of experimentally see if we can, if we can get this done. But if we can, in, if this works out in the 2020s, the, the way we might be interacting with all these data sets is basically you, you log on to your Jupyter Hub and you have the entire astronomical data world at your fingertips without having to install a single thing on your machine. Thank you. Yes, there's a, those are easy. <laughs> they're, they're somewhat smaller. Uh, but but uh, there's, a, there's a project uh, called, called CIMA um, that, is, that is trying to, to uh, one of the things we're trying to do on that is to, to build this kind of a platform for uh, multi-messenger astronomy. So it's, it's definitely part of it. So, so the economics is is an interesting problem because it's uh, we're, we're sort of in a local one. There is it, it truly is more expensive, and two, we're in a local minimum where it's even more expensive because we we have sunk costs. We've invested so much in existing data centers, existing infrastructure. Um, the, the the first part of it uh, of the total cost of uh, cost of ownership that's actually going down fairly rapidly now that Microsoft is a serious competitor to AWS. So the projection is that that's going to get better. Um, the second part is um, we we all periodically need to refresh our, our infrastructure, um, and uh, those are the points where it might be good. Say so you're building the next generation survey, you might consider whether I want to buy a whole lot of racks in the basement or whether I want to put that onto AWS and, and kind of refocus my staff on the, the, the know-how about the data set rather than worrying about changing hard drives and other things. Because what I'm arguing is, like what we are all good at is astrophysics and, and knowing what this data set can provide and so on. We should let running around the data set and switching hard drives and, and uh, fixing disks and so on, uh, we should let that to, we should give that out to others. Um, the, Sorry, this is turning into a long answer. But one thing I want to emphasize is I, I have public cloud right now in, in my mind when I think about this. But you could easily imagine the NSF deciding to do this privately. Uh, and they already fund a Jetstream internal NSF cloud. Um, and as long as there's enough computing there and it makes sense in terms of cost, it's, it's just the same. Oh, it, uh, it, it's, it purely depends on the size of your data set. Um, so, like, if you don't cut any deal with Amazon, they'll charge you $23 per terabyte per month to, to keep it up, up there. Uh, but that's, that's a total cost, right? That's, that includes everything. And then you have to uh, see how that compares to what, uh, what you're doing locally. Yeah. The, yeah, the, 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 I used to be worried about that. The, the beautiful thing is we're small relative to everything else they do. Um, and um, like we, I, you know, we, we show this to, we, we talked to, to, to a group at Amazon and, and a group at Google and show them the numbers. Like let's say we want to cross match petabyte against petabyte and we want to do it over thousands of machines. And they're like, yeah, we're not even going to notice that because Netflix does a lot more. Uh, they, the way S3 is so S3 uh, is is this um, uh, file storage service? It's, it's an object store service. The way S3 is architected, it automatically scales out when it detects that that you have a significant amount of access. So so in, in practice, they're telling us, and we're going to test that in practice that um, that however many cores we throw out at the problem, as long as we keep as long as we can keep that level of parallelization, they're going to be able to feed us with uh, with data. So, and it, it seems to be true based on every test we've done. I think we've gone up to about 500, 500 nodes 
um, going through um, the, the data set and like, there was no I.O. Down, downturn. So that's what you're paying for when you pay that $24, $23 per, per terabyte per month. It's not just raw storage, it's all that magic behind it to, to make it scale. So every time I've tried to put a significant program onto somebody else's computer, it turns into a fight. You know, we're not going to let you put that on our uh -huh. machine, you stupid user, uh, and we don't trust you. How, how is that going to work here? That's the beauty of this, because it's your machine. Right? So, so this, this thing up here, um, these are machines that, and, and storage that effectively the, the cloud provider rents to you. And they're they're entirely yours to use in any way you see fit, um, and your your effect. This is this is as close as it gets to you having your machines being physically in the same data center as everyone else. So so it's completely up to you how you want to organize it, what kinds of permissions you want to do. You know, ultimately, how much you want to pay for it. You can you can choose different uh, levels of service and so on. So that that's exactly my experience every time I had to do some something like that, and which is why I like this model, because it, it allows you ultimate flexibility. Okay, so. <laughs> okay. Uh, two and a half years ago, John Lucy sent me this picture and said, Paul, is this a gravitationally lensed quasar? And I looked at it and thought about it a bit. And five minutes later, wrote back and said, yeah, especially considering the high galactic latitude, it's a gravitationally lensed quasar, yeah. And uh, later that day, Al Artumre walked into my office and I showed him this thing. And I said, isn't this wonderful? It's a gravitationally lensed quasar. And he said, how do you know that? And I said, well, I've looked at a lot of these things and I know what they look like. And uh, yeah, this is a gravitationally lensed quasar. And he was skeptical in a friendly as opposed to hostile way. He, he didn't want to know whether I thought it was gravitationally lensed quasar, quadruply lensed. He wanted to know why I thought it was quadruply lensed. And that's a somewhat trickier question. So I went home and thought about it. And generically and specifically, the way you would do this is that you would come up for a physical model for this, a model for the gravitational potential and the position of the source. And you would, uh, it would have adjustable parameters, and you would fit the model, and you'd see how well uh, the model uh, fit the observables. And then you'd do the same thing for a bunch of uh, random quartets of points, and you'd say, oh, see, the, these four points are fit much better than the random quartets of points, so it must be a gravitationally lensed quasar. Uh, now, to do this, uh, for 20 years, I've been using Chuck Keaton's program to model gravitational lenses, and that I've been using it for 20 years tells you uh, both that I'm lazy and that Chuck has written a very good program. Uh, but uh, when you, but it's a program that requires some fussing with it, and if you were, you, you have to make an initial guess, and sometimes it doesn't converge. You might make a second guess or a third guess, and doing that for a large set of random quartets uh, would take some time. So uh, I set an. MIT freshman Raymond Wynn, the task of figuring out a way to speed up the modeling of quadruply lensed quasars. And after a few months and some false starts, and my pointing him in the wrong direction, and uh, we eventually came up uh, with something that we were reasonably happy with uh, that would be much faster than running uh, Chuck's program. Uh, and he began to write it up. And in the course of writing it up, he made a discovery, and that discovery vastly improved what we had done to that point, so that we now have an exceedingly simple, very, very fast, and absolutely rock solid, it will converge for every quarter. It's not a question of converging. It doesn't iterate. It will give you a model 
for every quartet of points, any quartet of points that you can throw it at it. Now, over the course, of, this was over the course of six months, uh, there was a second reason just besides intellectual curiosity, and that is that uh, in April of 2018, uh, Gaia uh, Consortium released, had data release two. Within the Gaia uh, Consortium, there is uh, a gravitational lens collaboration called GRAL, and these guys produced a catalog of 80,000 quartets of points, uh, for, among which they were going to look for gravitationally lensed quasars. Uh, and what we had done uh, was, was well suited to analyzing uh, these 80,000 quartets. It took eight seconds. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what they did was uh, generate 100 million realizations of quadruply lensed quasars and 100 million random realizations, and then used something called supervised learning. Uh, and uh, their machine effectively became what I was to Alar. Their machine said, yep, I think it's a lens, or no, I don't, but couldn't say why. So we thought it might be interesting to compare what we got with what they got, uh, and so uh, we've done a little bit of that. But first, let me tell you what our uh, algorithm is. Let me show you what some of the data looks like. This is from the Graal team. Now, this is the same system that this quartet of points showed up in, in the Gaia archive. Uh, and you see that there are four images. You don't get to, you know, it's just locations. It's not pixels anymore. Uh, and the question is, can you fit a model for gravitational lens to this? Here's how we do it. The recipe. Find the rectangular hyperbola passing through the four source positions. A rectangular hyperbola is one that has orthogonal asymptotes. In general, a hyperbola can have asymptotes that are tilted, but a rectangular hyperbola has orthogonal asymptotes. Then, find the ellipse that passes through these same four points, but has and has its major and minor axis aligned with the asymptotes of the hyperbola. That's step two. Step three is choose two of the four source positions, which two is somewhat arbitrary, but there are better and worse choices. And then find a new hyperbola that passes through those two points and the center of the ellipse. The second hyperbola and the ellipse give you the parameters of your model, give you the gravitational potential that's doing the lensing. Uh, and you might say, what happens to the other two positions? The other two positions either will be on the hyperbola or off the hyperbola, and the amount by which they're not on the hyperbola is a goodness of fit parameter. So they tell you how well, you, how well your model is fitting. So uh, let me show you from the Graal group four quartets of points. Uh, the very first quadruply lens quasar, Lucy's diamond, uh, Andromeda's parachute, the Andromeda parachute. And this one over here, you'll notice there are five points, and I'm going to be wicked. Uh, I'm going to throw out this image over here and instead include this random star here so we're fitting something which is not the four images of a gravitationally lensed quasar and see how it works. And here's how the system works. Bang. Uh, hard to see, but in the upper left, it's the two close ones that were forced to go have the hyperbola go through it. And the two ones to the right, you can see that the stars are slightly off the hyperbola, but not much. Again, second one on the top, the two on the left were forced to go through hyperbola. The two on the right almost go through the hyperbola, but not. Bottom one over here, it's the uh, two in the upper left that were forced, and they almost go through. Uh, and then finally here, here's the one where we were wicked, and these two Images. They're actually not far from the hyperbola, but it's measured in tenths of a radian, not in hundredths of a radian. So uh, real gravitationally lensed quasars are hundredths of a radian or less away from the hyperbola. Random quartets are tenths of a radian away in the two. And so we have a way of discriminating. Uh, how does, why does this work? Uh, there's been no physics here, right? Physics. You guys like physics? You, you became an astrophysics department. All right, you use something called the lens equation. The lens equation says that the deflection is equal to the gradient of a potential, of an effective potential integrated along the line of sight. And so 
uh, we've used the singular isothermal elliptical potential, not elliptical mass, elliptical potential. There is a position for the lens, x lens, y lens, a position for the source, x source, y source, uh, an axis ratio q, b, an overall strength, the size of the Einstein ring of this thing, more or less. If you take the gradient of that expression over there, you get y minus y source is equal to this thing on the right, x minus x source is equal to this thing on the right. If you take the ratio of those two, the denominators go away, and you get this equation over here. It includes both the position of the source and the position of the lens. If you cross multiply these two, you get something in the form xy plus something times x plus something times y plus a constant is equal to zero. That is the equation of a rectangular or a right hyperbola. Uh, hyperbola. Uh, so this is Witt's hyperbola and Sort of by construction, both the source and the lens lie on Witt's hyperbola. This was done in 1996, and if you read the paper, it looks nothing like this. But <laughs> uh, this is what he did. What Raymond did uh, was, he said, let's look at the modulus of the lens equation. So what we've done here is we've squared that y minus y source, we squared the x minus x source, and instead of just adding them, we multiplied y minus y source by q squared, the axis ratio squared, and when you do that, you get the same thing in the numerator and the denominator. You get x minus x source squared plus q squared times y minus y squared again, is equal to b. Raymond came and said I was able to simplify it. I said, Raymond, that's an ellipse! I felt like Kepler. <laughs> <laughs> What Kepler said was, damn, that's an ellipse. Anyway, the image positions have to lie both on the hyperbola and the ellipse if, it really, if this really is the right potential. In practice, it isn't, so they're going to rely a little bit off. But this is how you make the model. This is why the method works. Let me show it applied to uh, Hubble data with a Hubble Space Telescope image underneath. The images were forced over here. They were allowed to float over here. The, there's a prediction for the position of the galaxy, it's where the x is. The asymptotes give the orientation of the potential pretty close to the orientation of the galaxy, and the big O is the source position that you can't see. We chose to fix these two onto the hyperbola because there's some danger of the hyperbola being far enough out that it'll miss this and you only get four images. So it's better to force the two close images rather than other images. It also guarantees that you have the separation between them right and the fluxes of those images is a strong function of that separation. So now that you've got this model, you can also predict fluxes and use the flux ratio to improve your, your goodness of fit. The flux, fluxes don't go into making the model. They're only there as an, as an ancillary way to uh, see whether or not you've got it. How did we do against Gaia? Here's what Gaia got. These are the top six things that they think are lensed quasars, the Graal group. Uh, and there in the upper left corner is Lucy's diamond. I should tell you that ranked ahead of that, there are 24 random quartets that for reasons of the colors of the objects and things that they think are not lensed quasars. So this is still dilute by a factor of 24 and more as you go fainter down the list. But these are the top ranked things. All of these things were discovered prior to their running their algorithm. With the exception of this thing here, which they thought was a new lens quasar, it's a galactic latitude 4, and sometimes you get random quartets of points that are, look like <laughs> lens quasars, especially with a catalog of 80,000. How did we do? At the top of the list, we did better. Uh, we ranked uh, this guy the highest, and there were only three on the list above that, and there was still only 18 above this guy here and something less than over here. So at the top of the list, we were doing even better. Towards the bottom of the list, we were doing worse. Uh, in terms of false positive, we had, at, for the very last entry, known quasar, we had twice as many false positives as they did for the, la the last one. But why am I telling you this? Not because you're going to be looking for gravitationally lensed quasars, but because you are going to be teaching classes in which you cover gravitational lenses. And I think this stuff makes a hell of a good problem for a problem set. <laughs> Thank you.
So, so, is, there's, so the, once you've got thing, something that you think is a candidate, you, you then look to see if you can see the lensing galaxy, uh, you get spectroscopy and see if it's the same. The point is, you know, and, and it's a problem for Mario, with, you know, using Mario's database, to, to winnow down your sample to a sample that's small enough that you can then look at more intensively with what's available. You know, to go and look in the other catalogs and see what the colors are and stuff like that. So this is the first step to isolating things that you then look at more intensively. And then you do all the wonderful things that you can do with quadruply lensed quasars. But, but, you know, I'm not doing the science, I'm doing the finding the lenses because that is the hardest part. The science is easy. <laughs> yes, Lucy is finding the diamonds. Well, this is beautiful, um, not just as a problem set, I think, but let me ask you about what, whether or not you can do more with the uh, things that don't lie exactly on the curves. Because you were saying you use that as a measure of uncertainty. Well, I guess first to tell that it is a lensing uh, situation, and then as a measure of uncertainty. It seems to me that the biggest um, assumption you're making here is what is the form of the lensing potential? And of course, a real lensing potential will likely have a lot more structure. So I'm wondering if you've given any thought to how you might use the types of deviations you get, the positions, directions, and so forth, to, to try to learn a little bit more about the lens? Or is that, you know, not possible? So, so that, that's, that's what you do next when you start doing the science. The first thing is just to find the quads, and that's what we're doing. But I'm glad you raised the question of maybe you've got the wrong potential. Uh, first of all, if you have elliptical mass, then the ellipticities of the potentials are also very nearly elliptical. And second, which shows, and this is this beautiful degeneracy, and, and that if you take his elliptical isothermal potential and generate four source positions with it, then you can instead fit an isothermal sphere with external shear, and you will get exactly the same four source positions. So there's a degeneracy in the positions, but not in the magnitudes. So this is actually quite general. Uh, and there actually is a continuum between 100% ellipticity and 100% shear between the two, with the constraint that they both have to lie on the same axis for this construction to work. So this, is the, this works for all the known lenses. And the, place, the ones that it fails on are the ones where you have like a double lens. And so it really isn't elliptical, and it really isn't a singular isothermal sphere. You know, but it works surprisingly well for those. So this is a way to find them. And then you can make you can use Keaton's program when you want to do the stuff you want to do. And it's great for that. Thank you so much. Oh, one last question. Yeah, can you generalize if you're finding lenses where it's like a different number than other than four? Um, so the number of parameters in this model is seven. So uh, the, this group, the Growl group, also tried learning about triplets and they both did a lot worse and also better. Uh, they did worse because you had to wade through a lot more, but better because other people weren't willing to do it. So they found a couple more quads among the triplets with one object too faint to see. But uh, you'll, you, there is a, a one-dimensional family of solutions in the seven-dimensional space that will all fit all triplets if you just look at the positions. If you start putting the magnitudes in there to constrain your fits, that will help you. But you've then lost this uh, uh, sort of closed form solution for this, and then you have to do some kind of iteration. Uh, but there's now, you know, we can go longer. Eight seconds on a MacBook. We can spend a little more time on that, maybe. And so we can do some of that. That's great. Thank you. Mario, did you get an email from me? Today? Yesterday? Uh, I don't know. I, 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 I had some email issues and I haven't checked my email since about uh, uh -huh. last Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not offended. You didn't Sorry, answer. What, what was it about? I, see, I was going to suggest that we talk after the, this, these talks, uh, but you may have uh, a schedule. He has a schedule. If you want, you can take my slot. Where, uh, I'm on, uh, let's see, uh, you're three? Five, yeah, thank I'm at you. three. So if you want to talk to him at three, you can.
Uh, I think I'm supposed to talk to Avi now. And then... I'll add your example to the list of things that people do with machine learning that you can do on the back of the envelope. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, yeah, yeah, it was, you know, one of my jokes is John Henry. Uh, why, don't we sit, why don't we sit and talk to, for five minutes until Avi gets pissed off? Here, let me grab this. Uh, yeah, uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. How are you? You good? I haven't seen you in a while.